Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. Thank you for coming. Today, uh, my name is Michael Kugelman. I'm the uh, Senior Associate for South Asia here at the Wilson Center. Uh, we are delighted to welcome to the Wilson Center Ambassador Alice Wells, the Principal Deputy Assistant Secretary of State for South and Central Asia at the U.S. Department of State. Ambassador Wells is here to speak about China's Belt and Road Initiative, or BRI, and particularly the Pakistan component of BRI, the China-Pakistan Economic Corridor, or CPEC. CPEC is significant for a number of reasons. It involves two countries that figure prominently in U.S. strategic thinking. It is one of the more operationalized components of the wider BRI enterprise, with a number of new projects having been launched. It is also a case of uh, one of America's top strategic rivals, expanding its investments and influence in a country where Washington is arguably less present and less popular. At the same time, CPEC is also a high stakes risk for China and Pakistan, given very real concerns about financing and transparency, among other things. Um, it is not all that common for senior U.S. officials to speak publicly on BRI and CPEC, so we're really very fortunate this afternoon to have Ambassador Wells with us to give a U.S. perspective on CPEC, and we really are very much looking forward to uh, hearing her out. Just a very quick word about the Wilson Center. The Wilson Center was chartered by Congress in 1968 as the official memorial to President Woodrow Wilson. We are the nation's key nonpartisan policy forum for tackling global issues through independent research and open dialogue to inform actionable ideas for the policy community, and we seek to bridge the gap between policy and academia in honor of Woodrow Wilson, the only U.S. president to have held a Ph.D., a piece of trivia I'm sure that you all knew. Um, finally, I wanted to thank the Wilson Center's Kissinger Institute on the U.S. and, and China, um, our institutional co-sponsor for today's event. So now I will turn things over to my colleague and friend, Ambassador Bill Milam, uh, who will introduce Ambassador Wells and moderate this event. Bill is a senior fellow uh, here at the Wilson Center. He's a retired senior U.S. diplomat. He was ambassador to several countries, including Pakistan. So, Bill, over to you. Thank you, Michael. Is this a working? It seems to be, yeah. Well, this is, I tell you, a, a pleasure I've been waiting a long time to have, but I knew it was coming sooner or later. It's to introduce Alice Wells, who is now, I think, the principal deputy assistant secretary, but she's in charge of the South Asia and Central Asia Bureau, so I want to do sort of, you know, make that clear. I've known her since 1998, and I... After just a few minutes, I thought, I'll probably be introducing this lady sometime or the other at, in front of a large audience. She, before going, taking over the South, the South and Central Asia Bureau, she's been an ambassador to Jordan. She's been, had a number of uh, jobs. I suppose you've got her biography, so I don't need to go over this very much. Uh, but she had a number of jobs in Washington. And she was, uh, when I first met her, the star of our political section in Islamabad, uh, in the embassy in Islamabad in Pakistan. But I know you didn't want to hear m much from me. Alice, take over. And if you don't mind, I'm going to stand up. No, I, you, uh, I think we'd prefer that, actually. Um, I'm really grateful to have the opportunity to speak at the Woodrow Wilson Center, um, and I appreciate so much President Harmon's leadership. And I, I'm certainly one of the many legions of national security professionals, both men and women, who've been inspired by her commitment to public service and to the security of our nation. And I'm also, of course, very honored to be on the same stage as Ambassador Milam, who was my boss, and a tough boss, I would add, um, but who helped me learn the trade, and I'm very grateful. Um, and it was uh, terrific to have uh, Michael Kugelman bring me in because you know this is somebody whose writings enrich all of our understandings of the region. So thank you. I think that today um, you know there is an important debate that's putatively over models of development, but it's really about sovereignty and the freedom that nations can expect and that their citizens can enjoy. And America's position really is unambiguous. You know, good governance, long-term capacity building, and market policies. You know, these are the factors that enable the private sector 
sector to flourish and that are essential for sustained development growth. And whether it's Europe, Japan, Asian tigers, India, the U.S. approach to development has driven unprecedented economic expansion since the Second World War, lifting billions out of poverty. And as Secretary Pompeo noted last month, the grounding or the foundation for that progress has really been a free and open international order that the United States helped create and that at its core consists of a transparent, competitive, market-driven system that's mutually beneficial for all involved. And one of the greatest beneficiaries of that U.S.-led system of international rules and norms has undoubtedly been the Chinese people. In 1978, Deng Xiaoping announced his open door policy, encouraging foreign firms to come to China for trade and investment, and implementing sweeping market-based reforms to attract foreign businesses. And U.S., European, and Japanese companies answered that call and played a central role in the Chinese people's remarkable economic progress, bringing technology and expertise. But perhaps most critically, they brought the rigors and demands of operating in a rules-based global economy. As China's largest investor, the United States has celebrated this remarkable result. China's extreme poverty fell from 88.3% in 1981 to probably under 1% today, lifting more than 850 million people out of poverty. And as the Secretary said, we Americans um, indeed have a long-cherished tradition of friendship with the Chinese people. Uh, but as we all know, or as we all should know, the Chinese Communist Party is not the same as the Chinese people. People. What we see today is a Chinese Communist Party promoting its own brand of development, the One Belt, One Road Initiative, or what President Xi has called a project of the century. Around the world, and certainly in my area of responsibility, South and Central Asia, we see Beijing pressing countries to sign OBOR MOUs, emphasizing peace, cooperation, openness, inclusiveness, mutual learning, and win-win cooperation. That sounds great. And this vision is attractive for governments facing enormous development challenges and infrastructure needs. And we in the United States must welcome and do welcome any investment in trade that promotes sustainable, responsible development and growth. But after seeing OBOR in practice for the last few, few years, there are reasons to question the Chinese Communist Party's largesse. Uh, for example, China offers substantial financing, usually as loans, but Beijing is not a member of the Paris Club and has never supported globally recognized transparent lending practices. According to an estimate released by the Kiel Institute, Communist China is the world's largest official creditor, lending over $5 trillion worldwide. But China does not publish or even report overall figures on its official lending. So neither rating agencies, nor the Paris Club, nor IMF are able to monitor those financial transactions. Now, Chinese Communist Party officials recognize they need to use the language of openness and accountability, but the fact remains that the People's Republic stands outside of global efforts, including those of the IMF and World Bank, to improve transparency that enhances policymaking, prevents fiscal crises, and deters corruption. And this lack of transparency also hides risk to borrowing countries that already face substantial fiscal challenges, particularly since Chinese state companies undertaking OBOR projects have a clear incentive to inflate costs and encourage corruption. Failure to repay those huge loans raise roadblocks to further development. It leads to a surrender of strategic assets, and it diminishes sovereignty. Um, I'd like to note a few real-world examples. Um, during his term, uh, the former Maldivian President Yamin's administration awarded construction contracts to Chinese companies without transparent bidding and at inflated prices. So for example, the Maldives Airports Company Limited awarded a 400 million no-bid contract to China's Beijing Urban Construction Group to build a new runway after they had abruptly canceled an existing contract with an Indian company, which, by the way, later sued and won a $270 million in arbitration. Now, res the result of this Chinese project and others is that the Maldives, a country of less than half a million people, now faces an enormous debt that constrains the next generation of Maldivians, and half of this external debt is owed to Chinese lenders. 
In Sri Lanka, even though multiple feasibility studies repeatedly rejected the commercial viability of a large-scale port facility at Hambantota, Beijing went ahead and loaned the government over $1 billion for the project. The result, Sri Lanka struggled to service those loans and eventually handed over a 99-year lease on the port to Beijing in return for debt relief. We also see in Sri Lanka a number of Chinese finance projects sitting vacant um, and unused, including a $104 million telecommunications tower and a $209 million international airport in the south with zero regularly scheduled flights. Indeed, the Center for Global Development found in 2018 that eight OBOR recipient countries, including Pakistan, Maldives, Tajikistan, and Kyrgyzstan, were at high risk of debt stress due to Chinese financing. In one instance, because of the threat of drowning and unpayable debt, uh, Burmese officials massively downscaled a deep water port project in Rakhine State by over 80%, from $7.3 billion to $1.3 billion. Alarmed by problematic Chinese practices elsewhere, Burmese leaders reversed course, um, reversed course from a prior administration's decision. Now, the flagship of OBOR is the China-Pakistan Economic Corridor, or CPEC. CPEC is the Chinese Communist Party's largest OBOR initiative, reflecting over $60 billion in originally pledged commitments for projects in Pakistan. Chinese ambassador to Pakistan, Yao Jing, has repeated the oft-viewed char characterization of CPEC as a game changer for Pakistan. Um, in fact, the ambassador has said that China wants to see its relationship with Pakistan serve as an example for its relations with other states. Now, that might, in fact, be the case, because just as in the Maldives and Sri Lanka, after four years of CPEC, people in Pakistan are beginning to ask tough questions about what kind of deals their prior government struck with communist China and what Pakistan really gains. It's easy to understand why Pakistan's previous government leapt at the opportunity to conclude a, a CPEC MOU. Just like many other countries in the region, Pakistan has huge infrastructure and development needs. And for many of my friends in the audience who have spent time in Pakistan, you experience firsthand uh, those energy shortages. Pakistan has a sovereign right to answer these questions for itself. But I want to make a few observations on cost, debt, transparency, and jobs. On cost, according to Pakistani government statistics, for each megawatt generated by a completed CPEC thermal energy project, developers spent an estimated 1.5 million. In comparison, the cost per megawatt of building non-CPEC thermal plants is half of that, or 750 million. Similarly, CPEC's most expensive single project is upgrading the railway from Karachi to Peshawar. When the project was initially announced, the price was set at $8.2 billion. In October of 2018, Pakistan's railway minister announced that they had negotiated the price down to $6.2 billion, a savings of $2 billion, and he explained, Pakistan's a poor country, we can't afford the huge burden of these loans. But recent media reports claim the price has now risen to $9 billion. So why doesn't the Pakistani public know the price for CPEC's most expensive project, or how it's being determined? On debt, what are the long-term effects in Pakistan of Chinese financing practices, and what are the burdens that have fallen on the new government to manage, with now with an estimated $15 billion in debt to the Chinese government and another $6.7 billion in Chinese commercial debt? Because it's clear, or it needs to be clear, that CPEC is not about aid. This is almost always the form of loans or other forms of financing, often non-concessional, with sovereign guarantees or guaranteed profits for Chinese state-owned enterprises that are repatriated to China. Now, together with non-CPEC Chinese debt payments, China is going to take a growing toll on the Pakistan economy, especially when the bulk of payments start to come due in the next four to six years. Even if loan payments are deferred, they're going to hang over Pakistan's economic development potential, hamstringing Prime Minister Khan's reform agenda. On transparency, the lack of transparency can increase CPEC costs and foster corruption, resulting in an even heavier debt burden for Pakistan. For example, 
Last year, a Pakistani Senate committee report expressed astonishment at what they called the controlled bidding process for construction on the recently inaugurated Sakhar to Multan motorway. According to the committee, Beijing had allowed only three firms, all Chinese, to participate in that tender, while the entire project was financed by a Chinese loan with the risk entirely borne by the people of Pakistan. Now, given the lack of transparency, that road project has unsurprisingly been the subject of corruption allegations against officials from the previous government, including accusations of cost inf inflation and misappropriation of funds. Meanwhile, this China State Construction Engineering Corporation, which was awarded the contract, claimed to be extremely shocked by what they characterized as groundless allegations of corruption, asserting that the company came to Pakistan in the spirit of win-win cooperation. But importantly, in 2009, just a few years before this Pakistani contract, that same Chinese state firm was banned for six years from World Bank projects for what the bank called engaging in collusive practices, other words, corruption and bidding. And this is just one example. We know that Pakistan's National Accountability Bureau has a number of CPEC-related investigations ongoing. Now, the new Pakistani government prioritizes rooting out corruption, but the recently announced CPEC authority has immunity from corruption prosecutions. And again, those interested in Pakistan's development are asking hard questions. Lastly, on jobs, we hear the familiar Chinese catchphrase, win-win cooperation and mutual benefit. But really, CPEC relies primarily on Chinese workers and supplies even amid rising unemployment in Pakistan. And for these projects, Chinese companies are importing materials and equipment from China rather than giving that business to Pakistani companies, which would actually create jobs for locals. CPEC is even bringing in Chinese workers who earn money in Pakistan, take the wages back to China, leaving very little in the local economy. Now, China's statistics on how many thousands of Chinese workers are in Pakistan are so inconsistent and so unreliable that we don't actually know how many are there. But this is all the more extraordinary because Pakistan has an abundance of young, eager, and capable workers. According to the UNDP, 64% of the population is younger than 30 years old. They're, they're Pakistan's future, and they're hungry for opportunities. So when we evaluate CPEC, I ask you to keep in mind this contradiction. Communist China's own economic rise began with profound reforms that improved the business environment and attracted foreign companies from places like the US, Europe, and Japan. And those US, European, and Japanese firms trained local Chinese, who in turn were able to build China into the industrial giant that it is today. CPEC doesn't give Pakistani young people, it doesn't give Pakistani companies the same opportunities that the Chinese themselves enjoyed decades ago. And that's one of the reasons why Pakistan's trade relationship with the People's Republic remains so lopsided. In 2018, Pakistan's exports to China constituted 1.8 billion, while Pakistan's imports from China totaled 14.5 billion. There is a different model. The United States-Pakistan Business and Development Partnership stands in contrast to CPEC. U.S. businesses strive to contribute to sustainable economic growth, and U.S. government grants, and I underscore grants, have developed Pakistan's infrastructure and capacity in education, health, energy, agriculture, and law enforcement. Worldwide, we see that U.S. companies bring more than just capital. They bring values, processes, and expertise that build the capacity of local communities. For example, in Kazakhstan, Chevron and ExxonMobil have worked to maximize the employment of local workers through development of national expertise, training, drilling, project management, and, and cost engineering skill sets. Indeed, both companies employ locals for over 80% of their Kazakhstan workforce. In Bangladesh, Chevron has a workforce that's over 95% Bangladeshi. U.S. companies also bring superior quality and technology. We often hear Pakistani leaders praise U.S. companies like Cargill and Corteva that are passing critical technology and driving enormous productivity gains in Pakistan's huge agricultural sector. 
U.S. corporate social models are also outstanding vehicles that create jobs and opportunities for communities associated with these foreign investments. So the U.S. Pakistan Women's Council, for instance, fosters cooperation between American and private sector, Pakistani private sector, to mentor wo women and girls. An iconic American brand, KFC, supports the education of children with hearing disabilities and other underprivileged young people, partnering with schools throughout Pakistan. Procter & Gamble's Children's Safe Drinking Water Program has provided 875 million liters of clean drinking water to Pakistani communities in need. And that's the kind of private sector driven business model that we think Pakistan should continue to attract. During Prime Minister Khan's visit to the United States in June, or July, excuse me, President Trump was extremely enthusiastic about the potential for increasing and expanding our U.S.-Pakistan trade and investment relationship. And both our governments are working very hard to find practical ways to do that. We commend Pakistan for surging 28 slots on the World Bank's 2020 Ease of Doing Business ranking and also being highlighted as one of the top 10 reformers globally. The World Bank report highlighted Pakistan's ambitious reform strategy. The U.S. Commerce Department has already stepped up its activity in Pakistan with 15 trade delegations planned for the next year. And once the new Expanded Development Finance Corporation, or DFC, is stood up, Pakistan is going to be a country of great interest. The DFC will have more than double the investment cap than OPEC, increasing from $29 billion to $60 billion, enabling projects that have high standards and are financially sustainable over the long haul. Because mind you, unlike communist China, the United States doesn't tell U.S. business where to go. They go where they see the greatest opportunities for mutual benefit. And in that way, true sustainable um, development is really a marathon and not a sprint. It requires the development of effective regulatory framework, strong rule of law, fiscal health, and an enabling business climate. And I'd like to highlight just a few commercial connections underway that offer a sense of the direction that we envision. Uh, the U.S. firm Accelerate is prepared to potentially invest more than $300 million to upgrade a floating storage regasification unit in Pakistan's first LNG terminal. ExxonMobil has been working to support Pakistan's ambitious effort to access new LNG supplies. Over the last five years, PepsiCo has invested $800 million to expand its infrastructure and diversify products, and Coca-Cola has invested $500 million in the last couple of years, providing thousands of jobs for Pakistanis. Uber Technologies entered the Pakistani market in 2016 and currently operate across nine cities, providing employment opportunities for thousands of Pakistanis. And further, the United States government partners with Pakistan to adopt reforms, empower local communities, achieve self-reliance and prosperity. And just to be crystal clear, the U.S.-Pakistan Development Partnership has primarily taken the form of grants, not loans. One could cite a litany of examples of the impact of this development assistance. We've added over 3,500 megawatts to Pakistan's power supply, benefiting more than 42 million Pakistanis, as well as mobilizing more than 1.7 billion in private investment for energy projects in Pakistan, as well as helping Pakistan finance its first LNG terminal. We've trained 45,000 teachers and school administrators, reaching 1.8 million public school learners. We've provided 19,000 scholarships to Pakistanis to attend higher education in Pakistan. We funded over 800 Pakistani students a year to study in the United States, including the world's largest Fulbright program and an alumni network of over 29,000. We've trained over 91,000 law enforcement officials since 2010, providing vehicles, communication, and protective gear. We've provided almost 10 million women and children with health care services and built or renovated over 1,800 kilometers of road. 2,500 health, education, and other facilities, and 1,100 small water and power projects with programs benefiting over 1 million rural households. Over the decades, we can take pride in the fact that the United States has helped establish some of Pakistan's most prestigious educational institutions and centers, including Lahore University um, of Management Sciences, the Institute for Business Administration, the Jinnah Postgraduate Medical Center, the Center for Advanced Studies in Energy at the National University of Science and Technology. 
And lastly, the Commerce Department and USAID have provided key technical assistance to help Pakistan improve its business climate, from intellectual property rights protections to streamlined electronic system for trade to reduce time for cross-border transit of goods. In closing, we understand the road to sustainable development and growth is not easy. Uh, it can be difficult to marshal the finances, and it, can involve, it must involve a lot of necessary but very painful reforms. And that's where OBOR really raises the greatest concerns. We hope Pakistanis will ask Beijing the tough questions and insist on accountability, fairness, and transparency. Ask the Chinese government why it's pursuing a development model in Pakistan that significantly deviates from what, China, what brought China its own economic success. In contrast to the Chinese Communist Party, the United States leads a vision for the Indo-Pacific region that is free and open, that's comprised of nations that are independent, strong, and prosperous, and as Vice President Pence stated, our relationship in the Indo-Pacific flow from a spirit of respect built on partnership and not domination. For more than seven decades, U.S. economic and commercial engagement, security cooperation, and development initiatives have advanced freedom, openness, and economic prosperity across the region, enabling nations like Pakistan to develop their own strengths. And drawing on these pillars, we really do look to see and seek to deepen our partnership with Pakistan and others in the region as we work together to realize a better region, a better vision for this region and for the world. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Well, I learned a lot, uh, and I'd like to ask you a few questions if I may. <laughs> I don't have a choice, boss. Well, yeah, you do. There's a door back there. <laughs> By the way, uh, you uh, you said the magic words uh, Paris Club because I was a representative to the Paris Club for a long time, actually, in two different jobs. So that really alerted me as to the uh, as to really the depth of the problem. Uh, but I, I, my question is. Why is it, uh, there, I have several questions, but let me start with the one uh, that came to me yesterday. I was at another meeting, uh, not this big a meeting. Uh, there was a Pakistani of quite, of quite a good repute who uh, was talking about changes in Pakistan and how Pakistan was better. And I asked him about CPEC, and first, he said first, right off the top, he said, it's the best thing that ever happened to any country. That's a direct quote. That's an exact quote. Uh, secondly, he was talking in the lead up to all of this as if the economy of, of Pakistan was leaping ahead because, and he didn't mention that CPEC being the cause, but it sounded like things were much, much better. For example, he said, it's now has surplus energy for the first time in a long, long time. It has surplus energy. He said it was swarming with foreign investors, not necessarily from the U.S., but from uh, Asia Pacific regions. And uh, so I thought, I wondered to myself, well, if that's true, uh, are the do you, do, are the linkages developing that should have should develop to drive the economy because. As you mentioned, the debt thing is going to be serious, and in order to even come close to paying, uh, keeping up with it, they're going to need to grow at a lot bigger, faster rate than they have grown in the, in the past decade, I think, and that they were pro programmed to, to grow in the next in the future, particularly under an IMF program. So, why do you think that? Uh, and I hear this from Pakistanis everywhere. CPEC is the be-all and end-all, and they don't quite see the f all of the flaws you've pointed out, which I which I think I agree with um, totally. 
Well, I think there's been a tendency to conflate CPEC with grant assistance rather than understanding it to be the loans and, and loans not at concessional rates uh, that it is. And so when you break down individual projects, and again, we're, I'm not questioning Pakistan's need for infrastructure. There was a crying need and remains a crying need for infrastructure. And when CPEC was uh, negotiated in 2015, uh, the government faced a severe energy crisis, and there was a priority placed on developing um, energy resources. But I think what you know, CPEC exemplifies is what happens when you delink investment and development from established best practices and in infrastructure development. Because if you don't have the right policy framework, if you haven't undertaken the necessary reforms, you know, there are consequences to some of the development decisions. You know, energy, uh, you know, you know, coal, electricity production plants can be built, but if distribution is not simultaneously reformed, you know, you're producing for a system that can't carry the load, and the government is still committed as a sovereign guarantee to pay for the cost of energy that can't access be accessed by consumers. And so it's the conundrum of development. You have to get all the pieces right, individual projects done quickly and one-off, you know, without the system that supports supports and integrates uh, those uh, infrastructure projects are not going to be as successful. And so, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> That's like somebody's talking back to me. Um, the, I, and I guess what I would point to is that Pakistan is now in an IMF program, a, a, a large and uh, reform-oriented IMF program that was precipitated in, in large part by the run on reserves and the lack of foreign currency reserves. And there you see the double whammy of a CPEC project where um, when for instance, the Port Qasim coal uh, uh, electricity plant, I read in a report 99% of the inputs came from China. And so the fact that Pakistan has imported you know, all of the inputs for these projects while repatriating uh, profit you know, to the Chinese peristatal uh, has had an immediate impact. And so those statistics on you know, only 1.8 billion in exports to China and 14 plus imports from China reveal the immediate cost of CPEC. And so you know, I think that there's, you know, we want China to be a responsible uh, a supporter and funder of infrastructure. The Indo-Pacific region alone requires 27 trillion in infrastructure investments by the year 2030. No one country can do that. Um, we all need to help work to ensure that countries have uh, meaningful choices for sustainable and quality and uh, infrastructure. And I guess what what I think we all need to question, where we all need to push, is why isn't China adopting international standards? Now, at the second Belt and Road Initiative, you saw President Xi under some pressure to demonstrate that they heard the criticism of, on quality and lack of standards. But we still haven't seen Chinese uh, commitments to increase standards and commitments to uh, a green Belt and Road implemented in practice. And there are just some simple things I would throw, throw out. Why not? Um, you know, adopt Paris Club standards? Why not increase your concessional loans as well as incorporate grants as part of your uh, development assistance to lesser developed countries? Why not abide by the infrastructure principles that the G20, of which, you know, China obviously is a member, has adopted? Why not be transparent? You know, report um, your official lending to other countries. Right now, neither the IMF nor any other multilateral organization truly knows the indebtedness of countries who are involved in these One Belt, One Road projects. And that creates its own risks and could have its own knock-on effects. So the simple request is, you know, be a global good citizen, be transparent, you know, adopt the high standards uh, that G20 nations uh, should be promulgating. Good. Uh, I'm going to go to the audience in a few minutes, but I'm going to finish uh, a couple of other questions first, if you don't mind. Uh, the second question I had, and leading from what you said is, I mean, I think the incentives for China to change its habits are, are rather minimal right now, but maybe they'll get better. But wouldn't it help if, uh, and why haven't, uh, why is it, uh, 
why is it that Pakistan and other countries have been so uh, open to uh, Chinese, uh, these Chinese investments without really investigating them? And the second part is, uh, if the, uh, it, se it seems to me like that American investors and other Western investors, uh, other Asia Pacific investors for that matter, are missing a bet in Pakistan and, uh, and other places. But could that be because of Pakistan's reputation as a dangerous country? Could it be because they've uh, been through uh, how many IMF programs? A dozen at least. Uh, and none of them have ever worked very well. Uh, what do you think is holding the the, the West back on uh, on trying to move against uh, right. move in on that? Well, we lead with our private sector, and so you know if you look at the companies who are already very active in Pakistan, they tend to be some of our largest and most well known multinational companies who have a lot of experience dealing with risk and and can deal with the exposures and uncertainties of of uh, of a Pakistani market. Uh, but what's going to attract additional uh, private investment is going to be the the you know, the hard reforms that have to be implemented to create rule of law, contract enforcement, dispute resolution, currency stabilization. I, I, you know, I think there's a tendency to believe that, you know, that special economic zones might be the cure to uh, the difficulties in attracting investors. And I don't think that's our experience. Our experience is, you know, demonstrating that the that the framework for doing um, transparent business and and predictable business is available. So it's sometimes harder uh, to work with the Western model. You know, I as a, as an American ambassador don't walk in with a state-owned company and a financial package in hand. You know, other countries can do that. And so, you know, so I think what's incumbent upon the United States and like-minded partners is that we work very hard to ensure that countries have meaningful alternatives. And you've seen that launched under the Trump administration through the Indo-Pacific strategy, for instance, where um, we are in the, in the governance space and in the economic promotion and, and in particular in trying to enhance um, energy markets and digital connectivity and infrastructure development. You know, we, we're providing more resources and, and more programs and technical assistance to countries. Um, and at the same time, working with countries like India, Australia, and Japan, with whom we share principles, and, and I think you're starting to see a difference. Uh, I'm very proud, for instance, of our Millennium Challenge programs, where in Nepal we are helping through over $500 million grant to create hydroelectricity and better roads and hydroelectricity that's going to end up in a transmission line between India and Nepal, so enhancing regional connectivity, creating export markets. And it's that kind of thoughtful development. We have another MCC that we're launching uh, soon in Sri Lanka that will undertake the same kind of sort of nitty-gritty reforms in land um, registration and uh, um, motorway you know, harmonization that will, we determine, you know, help unlock economic development. So we have, we have to do our work. Um, and that involves, you know, working in closer partnership with our private sector. But we're proud of the fact that already the United States is, you know, has almost a billion dollars in, or excuse me, almost a trillion dollars in foreign direct investment in the Indo-Pacific and over, you know, 1.5 um, trillion in bilateral trade. So we're very much uh, a, a power in the Pacific. And these days, a billion is chump change, so I'm glad it was a trillion. <laughs> it's trillion. One more question, and then we'll move to the, all the people out here. Uh, this is a sort of a, a – you mentioned a lot about the region, the South Asia region. And, you know, I went to another meeting yesterday about Nepal, where it turns out Nepal is in, uh, you know, trying to in, have a federal system installed – where, and while the, the the Chinese are pouring money into the federal side and uh, and with without uh, paying much attention to the uh, uh, unf the federal the other uh, uh, parts of the government, and I see in Bangladesh that the uh, Chinese are reputed to be pouring money in, and they've offered I think use of some of the seaports there to the Chinese. And I see, you know, 
Sri Lanka look, uh, and others. There's th th uh, this economic diplomacy that basically this is what you were talking about mm -hmm. in For example, take Nepal. Maybe it's going to. Maybe it will. The federal system won't work. Maybe they'll be bribed to go back to a central system, which seems to me like China would like. Uh, you know, who knows what what will happen in Pakistan or Bangladesh? Uh, Bangladesh is already about as authoritarian as you can get. So, in any case, that's me de editorializing, not you. But. How do you, do you think that this has, uh, uh, do you think my worries about this has any, has any real uh, uh, meaning? Is, is, it, is it worth worrying about? Well, I think we see, um, you know, China is obviously very active uh, globally. Uh, Belt and Road is a global initiative for China. And in the Indian Ocean region, you have a strong Chinese presence in infrastructure projects. But in a country like you know, Bangladesh, you don't lose sight of the fact that we're the largest uh, single uh, you know, foreign direct investor. We are Bangladesh's largest export market. Uh, we have, you know, whether it's through Chevron as the as the anchor to uh, significant American investments, um, you know, there's intense interest in American companies in expanding their footprint in Bangladesh, and we can do so, you know, I using the new tools of the Development Finance Corporation, which are significantly more flexible than what was available under OPEC. It allows us to have equity investments to work with other development partners, and so we're actively trying to see how we can collaborate more closely, you know, with uh, Japan and with um, you know, Australia and India, which is also uh, obviously a very active uh, investor in Bangladesh. So you know, this is not, and, and sometimes it's painted as if it's a zero-sum competition. It's not. You know, again, $27 trillion in infrastructure need that will not be met by one country. And so how do we ensure that uh, developing countries can access infrastructure investment that's going to enhance their prosperity. You know, our global good, what, what the United States created after World War II, was an economic system that really, truly lifted all boats. Um, and we have a stake in seeing that system sustained. It's been good for private sector. Our companies have done well. We've benefited by being able to uh, create jobs in the United States through um, our exports. And the values that undergird you know, our private sector model of growth are values that we're proud of, free, open, sovereign. That's very well said. I think we'll now move to the audience if anybody has questions out there. Are there any questions? And, and here are a couple of rules. First, when I call on you, wait for the microphone. Tell us who you are and who you're associated with. And make it just one question and a question, please. Have a question mark at the end. Uh, the lady down here has had her hand up, so I'm going to start with her. Thank you so much. My name is Arifa Khaled. I have been a member of the Parliament of Pakistan for 10 years. So thank you very much. It's uh, your vision and your approach. I really appreciate the way you told everything uh, very honestly, very straightforwardly. We also have these concerns, what you said. But um, my concern is, my question is uh, very simple. It's just that, um, like I have seen the problem of electricity, I've seen the energy crisis, the gas crisis, and I have myself lived there when we had no electricity for more than 12 hours, and it's not easy in a very hot country. So you tell me a country which is, there are many people who are below poverty line, so what do you think? I mean, what would they do if, uh, if there is an impression that, oh, that's a bad country to go and work, then won't they bend towards China for whatever they offer? And uh, would they have many questions? You know, this is my question that uh, why America is not participating, even in CPAC, why? I mean, they can also come and uh, join hands in the companies and uh, for the next phase, 
uh, they can play their role, which I think Pakistanis would really welcome. Uh, that's my question. Thank you. No, thank you, and I agree. Uh, again, you know, countries are driven because they need infrastructure, and they have urgent needs for infrastructure, and you certainly saw that in Pakistan um, with the energy crisis. And that's why America was involved in, um, in helping to support the 3,200 megawatts that were added to the grid. But ultimately, the quickest fix isn't necessarily going to be uh, the wisest fix over the longer term. I mean, there, if building energy, uh, building electricity, uh, uh, production plants without uh, addressing distribution grids, without addressing the pricing structure and the subsidy structure, you know, leaves Pakistan with a circular debt that is very much the focus of this IMF program. And so, you know, we would encourage that <coughs> the right policy environment um, be developed and the right regulatory frameworks be introduced, in which case you really un unlock a multitude of investors who want to come to Pakistan. You know, and whether it's the Exxon Mobil or the Accelerate or, you know, or, or others that have a track record already in Pakistan, there is intense interest in energy development throughout South Asia. So don't think that the private sector isn't motivated to come, but they're going to be looking for that commitment to overarching reform as well. Uh, GE is a company that has been, uh, I think, our most successful company in partnering in some CPEC uh, projects, in part because they, they bring to the table uh, you know, uh, turbines that um, for which there are few competitors, and you know, and so they have found you know Chinese partners that they have worked together on uh, projects that meet international standards, that are transparent, um, that uphold the principles that GE um, and American firms stand for. And I always like to point out in Nepal, for instance, there's a U.S.-Chinese uh, joint um, uh, a project to drill. Uh, a tunnel. You know, we are perfectly capable of working together uh, with Chinese companies in transparent um, projects, uh, transparently, competitively bid that meet standards. This is a question about standards. And so I guess the one additional element I would put, or the one question that I would put on the table is, you know, why is it that so little of Chinese development monies go through the Asian Infrastructure and um, Investment Bank? Uh, which has been implemented primarily by ADB, so multilateral standards, and why has so much gone through One Belt, One Road? And to me, it's pretty clear. You know, one is upholding harder standards, um, and the other is, is relying on local standards. And um, and so our you know our goal is to see all major you know infrastructure developers uh, ensuring that the world is able to advance in a way that the benefits are reaped by the citizens uh, without the kind of environmental or you know ultimately white elephant projects that have been so notorious in some countries. Uh, there was a question over here I saw. Uh, I'm Will Embry from DynCorp International. Uh, Alice, how will uh, CPEC and the Belt and Road Initiative impact Afghanistan's effort to increase its economic ties in the region? Um, China has not uh, been a real player in Afghanistan development. Uh, you know, China is not a provider of of any significant um, grant assistance. It has invested or it has laid claim to a copper mine, a significant copper mine, but has never developed the copper mine. Uh, we, you know, right now, I would say, you know, I see opportunities for the United States and China to be, you know, important partners in reinforcing the need for a negotiated political settlement. And you see Ambassador Khalilzad regularly consulting uh, with his Chinese counterpart. Uh, among other regional actors, but I haven't seen China take the steps that would make it a real contributor to Afghanistan's stabilization, you know, much less stitching it back into the Central Asia and the international community. Most of the regional connectivity initiatives have come from the neighboring Central Asian states, you know, whether it's you know, Turkmenistan, Uzbekistan, Tajikistan, all of whom are developing rail lines, electricity lines, cross-border trade, and very positive developments that we've seen over the last uh, two years in particular with the opening of Uzbekistan. Is China helping them fund some of those projects that will connect them to Afghanistan? 
Not to my knowledge. Uh, we're going to go back in the back, way back there in the middle. Thanks. Hi, my name is John Dan Lowitz. I'm an associate with Bauer Group Asia. I have a question that um, uh, it pivots on. It's related to CPEC, but it's about the other kind of major form of foreign investment that Pakistan's been receiving recently, which is from the Persian Gulf. Um, the LNG relationship is increasingly critical to the bilateral U.S.-Pakistani economic relationship. However, um, American LNG firms, with the exception of Accelerate, kind of working on this FSRU front, haven't really been able to tap into the market for actual factual LNG because of these the high presence of these long-term FSAs from the Gulf. How can the United States more effectively argue to get U.S. LNG truly into Pakistan as a major source of energy as opposed to just a source of this importation infrastructure? Um, we stand ready to advocate on behalf of American companies and to seek the regulatory environment and the conditions that would allow them to compete fairly. Um, there are you know, major companies you know, currently um, exploring opportunities in Pakistan. And you know, the role of the Gulf has been interesting over the last uh, couple of years as Pakistan was entering its latest economic crisis. We saw uh, Saudi Arabia and uh, Qatar inject uh, infusions of capital into Pakistan, which again had the effect of illustrating that this is not a problem money can solve. You know, it's a problem that has to be solved by uh, reform and and whether it's uh, energy pricing structures or uh, regulations or currency you know, management and central bank independence and you know it, it's it's all of those very difficult but necessary reforms that are going to be the solution. Alice, uh, we started a little late. Do you have a little time? Mm -hmm. uh, do or do you have to run off? I have time. Okay, I we won't. Uh, too much, but I'm going to take several questions at one time. I see two right next to each other, right here: the gentleman with the tie and the gentleman next to him on the left. Uh, Karam Shahzad, uh, 92 News from Pakistan. Uh, U.S. position is all since the beginning of CPAC. U.S. position is always the observer of the project. Um, one of Pakistan's the senator mentioned. Pakistan is not only sharing the land, but maritime route um, during the CPEC project. My question is, all this commotion which is coming from U.S. is now because uh, do you think uh, U.S. is feeling threat in the Gulf of uh, Oman, uh, Arabian, City, uh, Arabian Ocean, and Indian Ocean? Uh, U.S. is having a threat of uh, losing its primacy in that region. My name is Micah Kyler. I'm an intern at the Hudson Institute just across the street. Uh, You'll have to speak up a bit. Okay. <laughs> uh, I wanted to ask, what is keeping China from developing a more responsible model for its uh, um, BRI projects? Um, is it something that the Communist Party doesn't want to give up because it benefits the country and they're not concerned about other countries in the region? Or what is the factor preventing them from developing a more responsible model. I'll take one more question in this group. Way back there, way back there. My name is Sardar Imran Freed. I'm a proud Pakistani American. My question, do you have any recommendations for the American Pakistanis like me to, to do something regarding what is happening in our part of the re region? Three questions. No, thank you. Um, no, I don't, I don't think the United States is feeling threatened. We're very proud of the long history of military to military cooperation that we've enjoyed with Pakistan. Uh, we continue to have you know, very uh, you know, increasingly constructive relations with Pakistan. Pakistan has been a um, very important actor in anti-piracy efforts where we've uh, collaborated together um, you know, in the Gulf where Pakistan has uh, had a, a liaison officer 
officer in Bahrain, where the Fifth Fleet is located. Uh, and this administration is actually asking for more from, uh, from neighboring countries to burden share on whether it's anti-piracy or you know, Iran's um, malicious efforts to complicate uh, shipping uh, through uh, through the Arabian Gulf. So I, I actually don't think that is a motivation at all, and I think that there is potential as Pakistan takes steps to uh, to move away and to restrict the ability of, of, of non-state, you know, sort of terrorist uh, proxies, that the, the potential for our relationship to grow ever deeper, you know, is there. And you saw that in Prime Minister Khan's excellent visit to the United States this summer and the very warm and constructive <coughs> meeting that he had with President Trump. Um, I, you know, with motivations, like why is it, wh why isn't China overnight more transparent? Um, I'm not a China expert, uh, but you know, I would, and my probably my East Asia Pacific colleagues don't welcome me opining. But um, you know, obviously the program was designed in part to be able to export excess um, uh, labor, excess, uh, uh, you know capital excess uh, production facilities. And so, you know, China was trying to solve one of its own domestic problems, and it's, it solved its domestic problems sometime at the expense, you know, of the receiving country. There are over 95 state-owned enterprises that are part of this Belt and Road Initiative and that have been engaged in um, infrastructure projects overseas, Chinese state-owned enterprises. And so I imagine there's a degree of, um, you know, difficulty in coordination. But I, I do think we have to be clear-eyed. You know, the rhetoric we've heard recently, including at the second Belt and Road Summit, is much better. You know, and if you read the rhetoric on green technology and a green, you know, uh, one belt, one road, that's all positive. But wait to see whether it's implemented. You know, I mean, that's where the truth is. And, you know, and I would start again from the very basic building block that needs to occur in transparency. And so when you talk about why American firms haven't been more active, because American firms half the time have no clue that a Belt and Road, you know, one Belt, one Road project is being bid, you know, or the bids are restricted only to Chinese companies, or, you know, the, the project information is not made available to the bidders in a transparent fashion. So I would just keep circling back to transparency. Let's ask for transparency. Let's make Let's let's normalize uh, what China is doing and make them, you know, a a good global citizen in the development space. Um, and then, as a uh, we uh, we're very grateful for our diaspora uh, communities. You know, whether it's you know Pakistani American community, the Indian American communities. You know, I benefit because of the energy and the interest that you bring to relationships to you know, your advocacy and engagement with Congress to your serving as sort of a, uh, the tip of the spear in, uh, in you know, humanitarian educational projects, you know, people to people, <coughs> it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a gift. And so, you know, I would say stay active, you know, keep being a bridge between Pakistan and here. Uh, let us know, you know, how we can support your own um, initiatives, and you know, we we look for ways to um, highlight and engage and and work with uh, members of the community. Alice, you got time for three more? Yes, yes. <laughs> I know this lady's had her hand up over here, so her first, and over here in the corner, second. Uh, good afternoon. This is Javeria Tareen, and I'm coming from Balochistan, where the CPAC is happening, and I'm running an independent think tank there, which is Balochistan Institute of Research and Development. And we closely work with the government of Balochistan because I'm part of the task force as well. And I'm a Fulbright scholar, too, because in 2013 and 14, I got the Hubert H. Humphrey Fellowship, and I studied from Arizona State University. And this year, State Department honored me to come and speak with the alumni network as an alumni and to the current fellows. The people in Balochistan, they are really looking forward for CPAC. And uh, they, they do think that this is a game changer. But as a citizen of Pakistan and Balochistan, we do have a reservation when it comes to the legislation for the citizens, because we want that to be as same as of in, um, you know, Gulf countries that, you know, the, the Chinese are coming. We welcome that. 
Uh, what could uh, U.S. Uh, this is a question, right? This You're is a You're going question? to yes. end it with a question mark fairly soon. Yes. And the second thing is we have seen that uh, because I represent the civil society as well and my background is journalist. So we have seen that uh, since last few years, uh, the NGO sector and civil society has not been provided a lot of opportunities. Uh, so... Uh, is there because I met the World Bank uh, president as well and I requested him that, you know, in Pakistan, we really need that support to, uh, you know, empower civil society. So that is also very important. That is a request. Thank you. Uh, sir, thank you. So, uh, There's two people over here, one at a time. Uh, sir, thank you so much. Sir. This is Jahan Zebali from AOI News TV, Pakistan. Uh, Pakistan right now is seeking investment from all over the world, especially for America. So is there any change there in the travel advisory for the American investors or Pakistan is still a dangerous place? Thank you. Thanks. Uh, I'm Alan Kronstadt, Congressional Research Service. Uh, Ambassador Wells, uh, that was a masterfully delivered speech and left me to wonder why uh, you are not a congressionally uh, confirmed assistant secretary. That's a comment. My, uh, my, <laughs> my, I'm glad it's a comment. <laughs> my, my question, though, uh, has to do with India. Uh, obviously, India is a, a major economy that has rejected participation in um, the BRI and uh, looks to what's going on in Pakistan with CPEC as a potential entrenchment or a new level of entrenchment of um, China and Pakistan's economy, uh, also other um, South Asian projects that include building and, and in some cases running ports that have potential for uh, future military use. Uh, given the Indian uh, uh, concern about strategic encirclement, I'm wondering if you can comment on the dynamics there and, and maybe uh, uh, as well as uh, how you engage with the New Delhi government in this context. Thank you. No, thank you. And it's great to have a Fulbrighter in the audience. Um, we're really proud of the Fulbright program, and it's our flagship largest Fulbright program. And it's created, I think, this uh, great community of, 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 of Pakistanis and Americans who better understand one another. So I'm delighted that you're here. Um, Balochistan is interesting because, you know, there have been tensions in Balochistan and, and at various times protests over uh, Gwadar port development. And it really, it, it really airs some of the... Uh, from some of the tensions involved in these massive infrastructure projects when you don't have the the outreach to the local citizenry, you don't have the corporate social responsibility that a lot of our major firms do in trying to build buy-in among the community and stakeholders and ensure that locals feel like they're benefiting personally. And many of the complications associated with Gwadar, in turn, you know, including now the very long-term lease that's been given to the Chinese, the question of how profits are going to be distributed between, you know, Pakistan and China. You know, these are all very real questions that civil society media, you know, need to and should shine a light on. Um, where we draw the line, obviously, because we fully support that kind of questioning and that debate, where we've been crystal clear in drawing the line is that we don't support violence. And so you saw the United States designate the Balochistan Liberation Army as a terrorist organization um, after they committed several attacks, um, including against a Chinese associate uh, with the One Belt, One Road project. So I think, you know, Gwadar is sort of a classic example. It also feeds into Indian anxieties because it's not clear the commercial basis on which Gwadar is being developed. Uh, and, and this has been a, a, a project very long in the making and not very evident to outsiders, you know, what's the economic rationale that drives it. I think India has been crystal clear from the outset that they saw the geopolitical uh, nature of elements of the One Belt, One Road. Uh, we share India's concerns over projects that don't have an economic um, basis and that lead to countries ceding sovereignty. You know, uh, Sri Lanka is not the only country that has ceded, effectively ceded sovereignty over key asset. I mean, you've had reports out of Tajikistan over land swaps in order to get out of excessive debt. I and mean, this is a real issue. And, and all I can say is that however much you might dislike the World Bank or IMF, um, you know, they don't take 99-year leases, you know, or, uh, or, or strip away 
the sovereignty of countries you know, that they engage in. And so let's be very clear-eyed about the terms that multilaterals bring to the table versus the terms that are being imposed under some of these uh, programs. Where we've been able to work, I think, effectively with India in a new way is in that quad format. And so literally, sit, it's very powerful to sit down with like-minded countries, you know, to sit down with Australia, Japan, um, India and us, and to look at the world and, you know, are we engaged enough? Are we reinforcing one another's activities? Are there possibilities through the Millennium Challenge Corporation to do cross-border connectivity? I've been involved with the Quad since we founded it about two and a half years ago. We just had our first ministerial level Quad. And so I, I see that as a, a real strong manifestation of our seriousness and being able to provide realistic alternatives for countries looking for infrastructure. Um, on the travel advisory, it's something we evaluate every six months. You know, we, uh, we want to see improvements in Pakistan's uh, security uh, situation so that we can reflect that in a travel advisory. Some of the steps I think that are very important um, are Pakistan's implementation, full implementation of the financial action task force requirements to counterterrorism financing, to prosecute and um, seize the assets of <coughs> of, uh, of, uh, of members of terrorist organizations. And as Pakistan is taking these steps, I, 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 it will uh, be reflected, I think, in how, uh, in both the safety and security situation and our ability to, to, to look at the travel advisory in the future. Alice, I think we've gone on for over an hour. I think probably there are more questions, but I suspect you really have to go. And Sounds like your voice is giving out too. Well, you've you've been a great audience, and I'm. Uh, it's wonderful to have an opportunity to talk. Now, hasn't she been a great speaker? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you all very much for coming.